Hey y'all! So I'm here with the very first Science Simplified video. I'm super excited for the series if you couldn't tell in my intro video. So if you haven't, give that a watch and you'll be able to kind of see like why I wanted to do this, how I came up with it, and I'm just really, really excited for this. So let's dive right into it and I told you guys it wasn't going to be too long, so trying to be concise, which is not my strong suit. So the title of this paper is Dieting and Restrained Eating as Prospective Predictors of Weight Gain. Uh, the head researcher was Dr. Michael Lowe. So he is somebody who I've, you know, followed. <laughs> I've read his stuff a lot and he's a really awesome contributor in the community. Now this is a review article, which means that it's not original research. So there was no intervention in this. They instead, you know, went through a database. They had a different criteria, that inclusion and exclusion criteria. And then afterwards that kind of spit out like X amount of studies. I believe it was 20 or 25 they finished with. Uh, and then that looked at kind of just trends in general for what they were looking for. So I wanted to start with the review because it kind of gives like that like perspective to you guys. And this is a really cool way to see trends again. And it doesn't mean because sometimes you can have a study and then, you know, something won't happen. And then because of the group and then another study, you'll see the complete opposite result. And you're like, what? So maybe if you don't just compare two studies and you compare 20, maybe you'll be able to kind of sift through, you know, better trends that way. So this again is a review article. It is not original research, but I think this is still awesome to talk about. So I will talk about review articles um, within this series too. So the I'll start, I'll read the first sentence, which is a cool kind of opener to this. And it's just so interesting to me. So uh, although it first appears counterintuitive, it is possible that efforts to restrict food intake might represent valuable indicators of susceptibility to future weight gain. So the whole context of this guy's research and this paper specifically is looking at ways to prevent weight gain in normal weight people. Because we do know that there's an obesity epidemic. There's a lot of people who are overweight and obese, overweight and obese in the United States, also other countries too. But maybe if we can prevent people who are normal weight from becoming obese, we're already like a step ahead of the game. So they're trying to look at predictors of you know, how to prevent that essentially. So really, really cool research. I think it's awesome because we need more people like this because we definitely need to figure out more sustainable ways to keep weight off. So this researcher and several others kind of talk about this idea of restrained eating versus dieting, which a lot of us might think is the same thing, but it's not in their context. So first of all, again, anything that you read, most likely, unless they explicitly state that it's about physique competitors, is most likely just about the average population. And for, th for this example, they're looking at different questionnaires and self-report things and just kind of just normal people. So when they say things like restraint, they don't necessarily mean like five foods and asparagus out of a bag. They mean just general healthy behaviors. Okay, there's cupcakes at work. I don't have to have a cupcake every day. Or I'm go if I eat a little bit more tonight, I might eat a little bit less tomorrow. Just kind of healthy food behaviors and just in general restraint, uh, which is a lot of times viewed negatively in our group. But in this case, if you are constantly restraining food choices, uh, I believe they refer to them at some point in the paper as more like Weight Watchers versus somebody who's a chronic dieter. So you're dieting and then you're down and then you, oh, I'm going to stop dieting and then you're back up and you're down again. So they were trying to look at it in that sense. Uh, so they seem kind of very similar, but they are a little bit differences, different with the nuances of how they are applied in the research. So when, if you do go and read this paper, uh, you will see that and it's kind of like, oh, this is kind of confusing and this guy talks about this a ton. So it, it does seem a little bit counterintuitive um, and a little bit kind of uh, clashing, but it does make more sense um, as you read along. But so think of restraint as just kind of like this restriction and like a Weight Watchers type mentality. So you're, uh, what they're trying to say is these people may be, uh, they might know that they're predisposed to being heavier, so they try to just constantly restrain their eating so they don't become overweight, versus the chronic dieting, which may be more up and down in nature. But they used a bunch of different analyses for this, but they looked at uh, a few different types of restraint measurements. So part of the inclusion versus exclusion criteria is that you had to either have one of these three uh, restraint questionnaires, which were the revised restraint scale, three-factor eating questionnaire, which I used in my research, and the Dutch eating behaviors questionnaire. So that was the restraint side of it. And then for the dieting side, they either asked, are you currently dieting or were you dieting in the past year? Uh, things of that nature. And I think they, they ended up with a 25 studies at the end, which is a pretty good amount. So that's kind of why I like review articles too, because they can kind of give you a overview of what 
is to be expected within the research and then if you you know in here they they cite a lot of stuff so if you think that whatever they're talking about is really interesting then you can go to the citation page and then pull up that study and then see more information there so i think this is really cool they also um they looked at people over the age of 12 so nobody too young because most people aren't dieting before the age of 12 or it's not reported and then again they were normal weight people so bmi was under 30 because over 30 is considered overweight so those were the uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria stats we're gonna skip on my by that because that's boring and nobody cares and i don't really understand it either <laughs> stats is like a whole big scary animal <laughs> um so they looked at the time between weight changes and the shortest time they looked at was one of the studies was five and a half months and then the longest was actually nine years but for most of the research it was about a year long period where they looked at weight changes over time so that's a pretty substantial amount of time and one of the results they found was that with the exception of one study there was no significant change in weight uh, and all studies reported average weight gain, which kind of goes along with these trends that we talked about, people gain weight over time. They looked at different analyses and different like types of the restraint and the dieting behaviors. So dieting predicted weight gain in 75% of their analyses, okay? While restrained eating measures only predicted weight gain in 5% of the analyses. Really, really interesting, right? So again, we kind of look at you know, restrained eating and dieting as similar things, but in this case, they're looking at them differently. And, you know, so clearly this is again showing that dieting usually doesn't work for sustained weight loss and you have to have behavior changes and just overall changes, whereas this restrained eating might be a better change for people for long-term weight maintenance. So I remembered where I saw the Weight Watchers things. This was at the end. So one of the hypotheses as to why this worked was that restrained eaters are perhaps weight watchers, whereas they're concerned with food intake and they try to limit it, particularly just energy dense foods, and they're not necessarily considered to be on a diet. Whereas people who are considered dieters are of course assumed to have the goal of restricting caloric intake uh, enough to lose weight. So that is like the big distinction. And like I said, this is kind of weird and kind of confusing, um, but I think it really is powerful uh, in this context, particularly for the general population because there do need to be ways to kind of, you know, prevent weight gain over time because we know that, that is the hardest thing. And even in this, like they saw that there were still trends, even in people who were restricting, you know, of, of slowly gaining weight over time. So it is really, really important to kind of figure out how to get people to have sustainable pattern. So from this study, and again, this is just one study, but looking one study looking at like 25 other studies, but that may be a pattern of restriction versus chronic dieting. Uh, because when you're dieting, you of course are lowering your calories enough to lose weight but you can't stay there forever so people who are dieters in this case would lower their food and then bring it back up and then lower it again and bring it back up so instead just having more of a you know restraint mentality might be better um, again doing things like avoiding calorie dense foods all the time that's a pretty simple uh, thing but it is some form of restraint so for people in this community we might think like yeah of course like you're gonna choose like chicken breast again the average population with maybe less food education these are things that could be taught which is super super important um, and there is one thing that I did want to kind of bring up and there was they did cite a really cool Delu paper which I'll probably do one of my reviews on this paper because I really really like it he's another awesome researcher and I want to read this just as is because I don't want to mess it up from this perspective having a history of weight loss dieting comprises a proxy of susceptibility towards weight gain from multiple uh, parentheses, genetic, environmental, etc. causes, but not from past dieting itself. It is of course possible that past bouts of weight loss dieting do help cause the likelihood of future weight gain, but available evidence suggests that among non-obese individuals, like studied here, weight loss and weight gain may cause body composition shift towards an increased body fat percentage, but not an increase in body mass per se. The fact that restrained eating is not related to future weight gain could be due to restrained eaters having less of a predisposition to weight gain or their engagement in more frequent or more effective weight gain prevention behaviors. So that whole paragraph is super, super awesome. It's on page five at the end of it, um, if anyone's interested, if you're gonna read this, but just like dropping knowledge bombs. So the, for the Duluth site, shifting more towards a higher body fat percentage is super interesting. He talks a lot about weight cycling too, which is something that a lot of dieters do. So maybe you're not gaining weight, but you're just gaining body fat, which is not a good thing either. So that's something to consider. And then the fact that they, you know, talked about too, they kind of tied it all up with the, the restrained eating may just be a better 
um, more effective weight gain prevention strategy. So again, you guys, this is a review article looking at a whole bunch of different stuff with just an average population. So this was the first one that I wanted to look at because I was rereading it and I think that it does have you know, some application to our community. And I think it's most important, not just for competitors, but just for like everyday living and everyday suggestions that maybe you guys give to people. So hopefully this was cool. This is the first, the very first Science Simplified. Uh, like I said, I will put below the description uh, for the citation so that you can look it up and whether you have whether it's open access I can't remember I had this on my computer for a really long time So I just printed it off, but it may be open access uh, or you may have to order it And if you do know somebody that a university they may have the ability to order it for you for either a discounted price or for free So those are just different options uh, But if not if you don't want to read it Hopefully this was a cool takeaway and you can look into more of Lowe's research uh, Michael Lowe from Drexler University. Thank you guys so much for watching uh, Please thumbs up if you liked it and just comment below. I love to hear you guys feedback. So thank you so much.